You're listening to Indications by the Conference Board. This podcast was recorded on November 5th, before most news organizations called the U.S. presidential election for Joe Biden, and before Biden himself claimed victory. Our panel focused on the choices facing the next administration. They did not start from the certainty that Biden would become president. Enjoy. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this podcast recording brought to you by the Conference Board and Oxford Analytica under our Global Horizons uh, brand. This is a special edition. We're looking at the immediate aftermath of the United States elections and then the outlook uh, for policy in the wake of that. So the results are still coming in, still being counted. Uh, some of the appeals, uh, legal challenges that are already underway. And the picture we have thus far is one which is uh, of a very close race, very contested race, and of the prospect for Firstly, at a fully extended period of uh, uncertainty or legal challenge, as I already mentioned, but also beyond that, a situation of really divided government and the unlikelihood of any one party holding both Congress and the White House in their hands singly. So I have here with me Dana Peterson, Chief Economist at the Conference Board, and David Kelly of JP Morgan to uh, examine some of the immediate uh, implications coming out of this. Dana, if I can turn to you first, in the prospect, looking at the prospect of divided government, certainly of delay, a period of uncertainty between now and, and, and running towards the end of the year, what do you see as the principal challenges uh, and immediate impacts of this, this period? Sure, absolutely. Um, even leading up to the election, there was a question around whether there was going to be a phase three in terms of fiscal supports for households and businesses. And we did not see uh, a resolution to that. Uh, and so the question is during the lame duck session, whether or not there will be passage of a bill to provide additional fiscal stimulus. Now, uh, Mitch McConnell, who is the head of the Senate and just uh, uh, won his reelection, has indicated that he does favor passage of something soon. Um, so that certainly does open up uh, a channel for other uh, uh, Republican senators to say yes uh, to a bill. However, uh, there's still the question around uh, what the House wants. The Democratic House wants something much more expansive that includes aid to state and local government. So that really does run uh, you know, the risk that we might still have these uh, challenges in terms of finding common ground. And one thing I would also add is at the end of the year, uh, there's again, uh, the uh, perennial issue around funding the government and, and there's always a risk of a shutdown, a government shutdown. And so it, there is possibility that in resolving that issue, you could have a few items related to COVID stimulus baked into that bill. Um, but again, there are considerable risks around us seeing uh, any additional fiscal stimulus before the end of this year. Thank you. David, if I can turn to you, do you see it in similar terms? Uh, well, I'm somewhat optimistic that we will actually have some stimulus. I, I think, you know, certainly it has a clo it's been a close election in terms of the Electoral College. It's probably not quite as close as it appears <clears throat> or appeared on election night because of the number of Democrats who actually voted by mail-in ballots. And as those mail-in ballots are counted, uh, Joe Biden's lead, both in the popular vote and in the Electoral College, I expect will uh, widen. Um, so I think that within the next few days, this will actually be all over, bar the shouting. Uh, and in that environment, in a lame duck session, I do think that Democrats and Republicans will find some common ground. Um, everybody in this country has been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. And I think reasonable people on both sides will try to uh, support American businesses and American consumers, particularly as we go into the holiday season. So I don't actually think there'll be a pushback on further stimulus. What I think you'll probably see, though, is sort of a, a breaking up of the stimulus uh, plans. And so the very expansive plans of House Democrats, which had a certain political tinge to them, obviously, before the election, I think the uh, House, House Democrats would be willing to uh, compromise on getting some things done, uh, and then let's look, look looking forward to the new Congress and a new administration uh, to try to uh, forward other plans. Uh, but overall, I, I, after a period of great divisiveness, I think there is um, a, a need and perhaps a desire on both sides to achieve a little bit more common ground and to calm things down for a public which is really very stressed by by all we've gone through in 2020. 
Hmm. Thank you, David. Can I stay with you, but I'll, I'll come back to Dana in a moment. So if we're talking about a fairly large fiscal stimulus plan, how, how large do you imagine it could be? I mean, we've seen some of the numbers that were, were floated uh, in earlier times in previous discussion that didn't go anywhere. Um, how, how big a bill can you get through in an environment where both sides need to compromise? Well, I, I, I think we're probably talking about an initial bill between now and the end of the year, which is less than a trillion dollars. Uh, but, you know, that, that still is a large amount of money. What I think you'll probably see is some more targeted efforts there in, in terms of things that really do need to be done in, in the short run. And I do expect that we'll see a second bill then with the, with a new Congress, uh, depending on how fast a vaccine is distributed and what needs to be done to improve testing and uh, tracing uh, activity around the country. So I think there'll be a great focus on finding a way to get us all past the pandemic. Uh, but overall, I, I think we're talking about much less stimulus in this fiscal year than we might otherwise have seen. If we'd seen a blue wave, I think you could have seen up to $2 trillion in extra st stimulus um, in the current fiscal year. Uh, I think it's unlikely to be more than $1 trillion now, but it's still an awful lot of money. Uh, but, I, but I do think that this result of divided government means less fiscal stimulus uh, than either a red wave or particularly a blue wave would have meant. Uh, Dana, what's your expectation for the size of stimulus that we could be looking at? Um, I definitely agree. Um, I think the size of stimulus is going to be smaller relative to what House Democrats were looking for, but potentially a little bit larger than what uh, uh, Republican uh, senators were, were stating. Um, but, but certainly, I think we'll see something. Uh, and the key thing is when, uh, because it usually takes a couple of months before it really has an impact on the economy. And that matters a lot for uh, the first quarter of the year and how strong or weak the economy is going to be. And certainly, when we look at uh, the number of announcements from businesses, uh, many are saying that these temporary furloughs may become permanent. And certainly, we've heard that out of the airline sector, out of the financial sector. Um, and so uh, stimulus from the government could come at a really pivotal time when uh, more and more households are seeing shocks to not only income, but also uh, employment. Thank you. Can I talk now a little bit about, about Q, this, the impact on the economy against macroeconomic backgrounds? So obviously, we had um, a horrifically bad Q2, very, very positive Q3. Uh, it's difficult to speak about Q4 as we're not yet even halfway into it. But nevertheless, uh, let me ask you to do so. If we don't have a stimulus plan coming through yet, if economic activity is again being disrupted, um, what is your expectation for, for Q4? And particularly, what are the sectors or some of the um, state economies that particularly concern you, Dana? Sure. Our expectation for the fourth quarter is that you're going to have a significant slowdown in terms of growth relative to the third quarter. Now, I mean, the third quarter, we grew more than 30 uh, percent on a seasonally adjusted quarterly annualized basis. So uh, the fourth quarter is not going to look anything like that. It's probably going to be in the range of one to two percent. Um, but when we think about what's going on here, uh, certainly when we look at jobless claims, we even received a, a, an update for this week. Uh, they're still pretty elevated. And when you look at different sectors, you're, you're definitely seeing differentiation. So your sectors that I like to call the work sectors are doing quite well. So that includes manufacturing, uh, the financial sector, technology, and healthcare. Uh, meanwhile, sectors that I call the play sectors, where it's very difficult to affect social distancing or it requires person-to-person uh, -person interactions, those sectors are still doing quite poorly, including airlines, um, uh, entertainment, hotels and restaurants, certain types of retail. And so we're still con continuing to see those trends. And certainly in the U.S. in particular, we are seeing the number of cases rise. And however, we're not anticipating uh, the level of uh, uh, restrictive measures that we saw back in the spring, spring in terms of lockdowns. Many of those lockdowns are probably going to be targeted, but it still does have an effect on how people feel. And certainly uh, we could see, uh, we did see a slight weakening in October in terms of consumer confidence, and that could carry over into how uh, households feel about spending ahead of the holidays, 
or whether they're willing to go out and engage in consuming services. Uh, David, is that your reading too? Yeah, I, I'm looking for slightly more strength in the in the fourth quarter. Uh, I'm very impressed by the ability of uh, auto sales um, uh, dealerships to actually sell vehicles in this environment, uh, which seems to be pretty good. And uh, also the housing industry is looking very strong. Uh, but uh, I do think that the growing pandemic is going to put a damper on activity over the um, holiday season and into new year and uh, into the new year, and particularly obviously for the services sectors of the economy. But but the way we broadly see it is we're in a waiting period here. You can't have a healthy economy until you deal with the pandemic. Uh, so following you know a better than thirty percent gain in GDP in the third quarter, we're looking for about three percent in the fourth quarter, maybe something similar in the first quarter, maybe even a little bit less. But then we think activity will accelerate, particularly next summer and next fall, if we simultaneously um, uh, you know, adopt a better public health measures to try to uh, squash the virus and we distribute a vaccine. And then by the fall uh, uh, and winter of next year, I think if we're all back to normal, that, that, will be, that will represent a huge surge in service sector activity. So I do think that the economy is going to quicken a lot in the second half of next year. It's just getting there that's the problem. Thanks. I mean, can I ask you about about the uh, the situation with regard to COVID? Uh, the United States has actually um, uh, just now uh, touched the you know, st- astonishing barrier of, of more than a hundred thousand new cases a day uh, recorded yesterday. Um, do you feel that there are ways that a stimulus package can actually tackle that uh, or a surge to address that? Uh, so, yes, I think it can, but I think the more important thing is simply leadership on the issue. Uh, unfortunately, during the election campaign, we got very mixed messages um, from the administration uh, with, uh, you know, a sort of half-hearted urging of being careful and wearing masks. But at the same time, obviously, the president conducting rallies all over the country, which uh, were clearly not in, in accordance with the guidelines uh, of health officials. And I think that left a very strange left us in a strange position. I think the key thing here is to have decisive leadership on this issue, not necessarily to lock down various things. Everybody's trying to adapt to this environment, and some people are doing it quite successfully. But to to say, look, wearing masks is not a burden in any circumstance. So we need 100% compliance with that. We need uh, real unity among state governments and real uh, uh, a unified set of policies. So I think that will help and where stimulus really helps is obviously first helping people avoid the economic necessity of working in dangerous situations, um, but also in testing and contact tracing. Because, you know, you talked about 100,000 cases. Well, of course, we know that's not actually accurate. There are far more than 100,000 cases, probably, you know, uh, double or more than that. Uh, the problem is we're just not uh, uh, testing those cases. Um, so uh, we need to get the number of cases down, but then we need to actually record the cases that are occurring so that we can contact trace and isolate people and so that we can gradually uh, you know, destroy the pandemic because it ha- has had a tremendous impact on everybody's life. Uh, and I think that uh, really it's not so much about the money, it's about the leadership. Uh, money will be needed, but it's really leadership that's going to get us past this pandemic. Thank you. Dana, uh, we've talked about the impact on hospitality being se- particularly severe uh, up to this point. Um, to what extent you you fear this scarring is going to be permanent and there could be a permanent loss of demand in that sector, aside from uh, the shorter term disruption? Sure. I, we think that there's potential for permanent scarring with respect to how people consume and travel. So, for example, you may have a return in with respect to uh, households traveling, going on vacations, but they may go, but they may go on different types of vacations. So, for example, what we've seen throughout the pandemic is that people are renting or buying cars and going on shorter trips that don't involve airplanes. So, certainly, we're going to have to get to the point where people feel comfortable doing that sort of thing. Uh, but then, when you look at business travel, uh, many businesses are realizing, and even their their clients and customers are realizing that you can transact business virtually and that you don't necessarily need to travel. So we think that there may be a fundamental change in business travel 
um, which will have a negative impact clearly on the hospitality sector, which depends very much on business travelers using airplanes, using hotels and restaurants along those routes. So in that sense, there could be a permanent change that would be very negative for the hospitality sector. Thank you. David, can I turn, turn back to you? Um, we've been talking about the scale of, of stimulus not being as great as, as maybe as it could have been if we're in the circumstance of, of divided government. Um, are you worried that ultimately the strain on the Fed uh, to uh, carry so much of the burden of macroeconomic management um, could become difficult to bear? No, I'm, I'm actually, I actually feel better about this version of dealing with our economic problems more than I would have in terms of a, a, a wave scenario, either red wave or blue wave. Uh, the country needs fiscal stimulus, yes, but I mean, really fiscal support is a better word. Um, but it needs that, but it also needs to get past the pandemic. Um, but for the Federal Reserve, low interest rates themselves aren't really doing anything to stimulate the economy or right? not anything significant. Uh, what, what they are doing is they're enabling the federal government to borrow vast quantities of money at low rates. And that is really what the Federal Reserve is doing. It's the QE rather than the low rates that are making the difference. Uh, to the extent that we've got less fiscal stimulus, I think that the Fed will need, uh, the Fed will be able to do that job uh, without, um, you know, expanding its balance sheet quite so much. I think that, I think that's fine because again, the economy has got a natural liftoff point uh, when we conquer the virus. So, you know, I, I know a lot of people have regretted the fact that if we don't have a wave result, and particularly if we didn't have a blue wave, we wouldn't get a big fiscal stimulus. We wouldn't get that accelerator. But frankly, in the political car, I'm as worried about whether the brakes are working as whether the accelerator is working. Uh, because I, my great fear is that we would put too much stimulus into the economy and then not have the, the political backbone to pull back on that stimulus before the deficit, the debt, and the Fed's holdings of government debt grow to such a level and accelerate at such a level that we really precipitate a financial crisis. So I'd, I'd much rather have a more moderate uh, policy um, approach to, to stimulate the economy and a more, much more disciplined and determined approach to helping the private sector of the country get back to normal in terms of controlling the pandemic. Thank you. Dana, do you see it that way? Well, I think the Fed is already uh, kind of struggling with this. Indeed, you continue to have pleas from Chair Powell uh, for uh, greater fiscal action. So I think the Fed is already quite uncomfortable with uh, the the burden of responsibility it has to it has had to undertake. Um, and clearly, I mean, I agree that it's going to be very difficult to pull back the accommodation uh, because we've seen a few episodes uh, since 2013 uh, where financial markets reacted very negatively to the Fed um, attempting to normalize interest rates. Um, as well as uh, uh, drawing down uh, purchases of, of, of uh, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities uh, to help bring down the, the level of the balance sheet. And so there are a lot of risks around that. Um, so I think that if we don't have, uh, again, coordinated leadership um, between the federal and state and local governments in terms of containing and controlling and tracking the virus, um, and also, if we don't have additional uh, fiscal support uh, to get us over the hump of the epidemiological risk, uh, in which meaning the virus, and we don't know how long it's going to continue to infect people, then, then it's going to be even more challenging for the Fed. I mean, the Fed has done a lot. It hasn't run out of all of its tools, but certainly this is an opportunity for fiscal policy to step in and help uh underpin the work that the Fed is doing. Thanks, Dana. Uh, can I ask you uh, finally about, about the debt? Um, if I have a situation where debt has increased massively uh, right across the world, central bank is saying it's time for fiscal policy to take up more of the slack, as you mentioned, but specifically um, on the debt, uh, with having grown so much, if government is divided, uh, what is your or do your instincts for, for where fiscal policy is going to go? Is this debt just going to sit there or will there be measures taken to, to try and get more of a handle on it and pay it down? Well, actually, before, uh, before the pandemic and even before uh, the tax reform, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, 
the U.S. was already headed towards a fiscal crisis. And it was because we were not collecting enough revenues. However, we had these outstanding um, uh, commitments with respect to uh, entitlement programs for, for our, our senior citizens, for our uh, folks who don't have a lot of money. Um, and, and, and the only type of austerity that we ever saw was around discretionary spending. And really, it was the mandatory expenditures that were going to lead to very large federal budget deficits and debt. And now, you know, fast forwarding, we've had uh, several events that have uh, led to widening of annual federal budget deficits and a greater and faster accumulation of debt. I mean, so far, markets are have been quite forgiving, and they have not punished the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, sovereign uh, uh, ratings downgrade or, or even threats of doing so. And many people argue, well, that the U.S. Um, you know enjoys absorbent privilege. You know, it, its debt is, is is in its own currency, and there's always going to be demand for a safe haven asset like U.S. Treasury debt. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that uh, there would be any real catalysts apart from markets um, punishing the U.S. in terms of action, in terms of either raising revenue, doing a combination of, of raising revenue uh, and or uh, reducing spending. So you, you definitely need some kind of catalyst because it's not clear that there's going to be um, concerted effort around addressing these issues. And it's only going to get worse as we have more and more U.S. citizens reaching 65 and retiring and um, expecting to be to have access to those uh, commitments that we've made to them in the form of entitlements. And I would also add that, you know, before uh, the pandemic, uh, net interest was rising at a, a rapid clip. So if anything, the Fed lowering rates to the zero lower bound has helped uh, slow the, the increase in interest rate um, uh, payments. But certainly at some point, the Fed is going to raise interest rates, um, at least not until 2024, it seems. But those interest rates are going to rise, and that's going to have implications for debt service. And that's just going to make debt even more uh, expensive in the U.S. Thanks, Dan. David, you too uh, see, see a debt, debt, well, the debt horizon looking like that? Yes, I'm, I, I'm very concerned about the debt issue because one of the problems with, with populism is that we just don't take uh, tough decisions. And while there's tough decisions that need to be made on the spending side, there are also tough decisions that need to be made on the revenue side. And I'm trying to figure out, is there any environment in which you could see Democrats and Republicans come together um, in a way that would reasonably try to raise the revenue necessary to uh, rein in the debt? If you don't do that at some stage, I mean, what's going on is the level of debt continues to grow. It's now already at its highest level since just after World War II, and it's going to go past that. And sooner or later, you're going to end up with inflation. And when you end up with inflation, you're going to end up with higher interest rates. And when you end up with higher interest rates, it's going to be very, very difficult to uh, finance that debt. So, you know, I suspect that, you know, 20 years down the road, There'll, we'll be sort of looking back at the, the good old days when we didn't realize the problem of accumulating all this uh, this debt. But uh, sooner or later, this is there's going to be a comeuppance here because we are building debt, we're building assets, um, uh, the value of financial assets, but we're just not um, dealing with the uh, financial reality, the long-term economic reality that you have to pay your bills. Um, and I do think this will will ultimately end badly because I just don't see the political will to actually attack this issue of managing the federal finances, um, given the sort of populism of both the right and the left, and the sort of distraction of the public by that populism. Thanks, David. Is that is that your your one word of advice for the new administration? Think, think I, about this. Think about the debt right now. Well, no, my, my, no, not exactly. I think I think my my word of advice for the new administration, and perhaps I'll follow it anyway, is. Just recognize just how psychologically disunited America is here and do everything you can to reach out to people and politicians from the other side um, to try and find common ground, to try to uh, get back to a sort of a sane kind of politics where it's not just the politics of personal destruction or insults um, or division, uh, but really trying to figure out, look, we, we're, we've all got a limited time on this planet and in this country and in politics. 
let's see what we can do to try and deal with some of the long-term problems of America um, without uh, making those problems worse. Let's try and make them better. But I think it's really focus on getting to unity and sanity in dealing with these issues rather than trying to score political points. I think that's what's really important. Dana, to you, I know you. if you had to uh, focus on, on sort of economic problems or maybe on, on public finances, what would your advice be to the incoming administration? So cooperation is paramount here in order to, so I would agree with that very much so, in order to address the issue of the pandemic and, and curbing its spread uh, and also uh, making sure that we can uh, heal the economy. And, and so when I think about the things that are going to drive uh, the economic outlook, uh, certainly number one is the evolution of the virus. Uh, number two is certainly widespread availability of treatments and vaccines, which uh, our hope is that we can see that at least by the summer, that can result in uh, a burst in spending in the second half of next year. But also, you know, what are the strategies of state, local, and federal governments? Are they all moving and working together in order to encourage curbing uh, of the spread of the virus and making sure that people also have access to vaccines once they are available? And, you know, certainly all of these things really do matter. And so I, I would have to agree cooperation is the key word here uh, that I think um, you know, which, who, what the next uh, administration uh, should be paying attention to. Okay, that's great. I'm just going to bring it to a close there. Dana, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and David, thank you too. Thank you. So the next uh, webinar that we have within the Global Horizon series is on December the 3rd. It's looking at trade and intellectual property and global co uh, collaboration, the frameworks for it, 20, 21st century style agreements. So please register for that. You're very welcome. But for now, it only remains to me to thank once again, Dana, thank David, and to wish you all a very good day. Goodbye. This has been Indications from the Conference Board.